All right, so today's event, uh, the path to peace in Ukraine. Um, we know that um, the Ukraine, that the Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a violation of international law. Um, it's been brutal, it's caused immense suffering, um, but we wanna bring in some additional context um, for, for folks living here in Canada. It's critical that we consider our own government's role in this terrible, terrible situation. Um, and unfortunately, Ottawa has long been hawkish. Um, on the one year anniversary, uh, just two months ago of Russia's invasion, um, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie declared, right now is not the time to talk about peace. It's, uh, it's a time to arm them, she said. And a few weeks later, she called for regime change in Moscow and criticized China's attempts to broker peace. So it's becoming increasingly hard to argue that Canada is not de facto at war with Russia. Um, Ottawa sent $2 billion in weapons um, to, the to Ukraine, so reportedly has special forces on the ground, trains Ukrainian uh, forces in the UK and Poland, and offers significant intelligence support. Um, and a few days ago, two more former Canadian soldiers were killed fighting near uh, Bakhmut. Um, the operations, uh, Operation Unifier training mission through that, Canada has arguably been in a proxy war with Russia since 2015, uh, with one aim uh, of this mission to bring Ukraine, um, uh, Ukraine's military into NATO. So as many, many have pointed out, a central factor driving regional tensions is NATO expansion. And since the early 90s, Canada has pushed very hard to expand NATO. And most recently, um, our foreign minister, Melanie Jolie, traveled to Kyiv uh, in January 2022 to promote uh, Ukraine joining NATO. So we want to find a way out of this. And in order to do so, we need to come to terms with the history of this war. And so at CFPI, we're asking that instead of further fueling the conflict, Ottawa should push uh, to negotiate a way out of it. And now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs is a professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. He's authored and edited numerous books, including three New York Times bestsellers, The End of Poverty, Commonwealth, Economics for a Crowded Planet, and The Price of Civilization. His most recent book is The Age of Globalization, Geography, Technology, and Institutions. Sachs was ranked by The Economist among the top three most influential living economists and twice named as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential World Leaders. He's widely recognized uh, for bold uh, and effective strategies to address complex uh, challenges, including the escape from extreme uh, poverty, the global battle against human-induced climate change, international debt and financial crises, national economic reforms, and control of pandemic and epidemic diseases. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction, uh, not of me, which was very kind, but of the subject uh, of the importance of understanding the context and of the uh, aggressiveness of uh, Canada uh, as part of a uh, US-led alliance. Uh, also, I'm delighted to uh, be together with Professor Kachanovsky, whose uh, work I really admire. Uh, and he has an important uh, part to tell about this. Just uh, for context, I was on the economic advisory team of President Gorbachev 34 years ago. I was an advisor to President Yeltsin uh, 31 years ago. I was an advisor to Ukraine's President Kuchma uh, 30 years ago. I was an advisor to President Yushchenko about 27 years ago. I know this story from the beginning. This is a story about NATO expansion. And uh, this is a story that you will not read in the mainstream media. This is a story that the US government works overtime to hide and to dissemble. And this is most unfortunate. Uh, most governments don't tell the truth about anything anymore, but I wait for the United States to tell the truth about anything anymore, because I do not believe uh, anything that comes out of Washington these days about this war and much else, unfortunately. Sad to say, this is a war that could readily have been avoided at so many times because first the Soviet Union 
And then leaders of Russia said over and over again, do not expand NATO to Ukraine. Is this such a hard concept to grasp? I think we should just contemplate if Mexico and China make a military alliance, the United States is not going to say, and Prime Minister Trudeau is not going to say, well, that's their choice. It's an open door. They can do what they want. That's pretense or arrogance. I don't know which for sure, but the United States has said, we don't care what Russia says about what we do. And it is formal NATO policy stated repeatedly, our decisions of where we go cannot be influenced by third countries, period. So NATO assumes that it can move to anybody's border without complaint or response. If you want to know why this war occurred, that's it. That's the one sentence explanation. The rest is details. And of course, people will say, oh, that's so wrong, Professor Sachs. What, what happened to you? Are you crazy? Because that's what I hear from people who read the New York Times each day, because that's what they're fed. Because we're fed stories. I'm sorry I was there at these instances. I was actually there. Professor Kachanovsky is the world expert on what happened at the Maidan. I was there the day after because I was asked to be there by the next government and it was explained to me how the US NGO so-called funded the protests on the Maidan, paid for it. Oh, we'd feel great if the Chinese paid for the January 6th uh, demonstrations in Washington. We'd say, oh, that's just fine. Well, the United States paid for the Maidan, but you won't read about it in the New York Times. So, okay. <laughs> We live in a world of lies and the United States is run by confidentiality, except when somebody leaks stuff, but everything is supposed to be secret. So let's just disentangle for a few minutes what actually happened. What actually happened is that starting in 1989 and 1990, the United States and Germany repeatedly explicitly represented to Gorbachev that NATO will not move one inch eastward towards the Soviet Union if the Soviet Union disbands the Warsaw Pact. And you can go on the National Security Archives of George Washington University. The article is called What Gorbachev Heard. And just look at it online. You'll find about 30 archival documents that tell the truth. So the US promised no NATO enlargement. And you know what? I'll tell you a secret among the 427 of us, the United States lied. Because already starting in 1992, there were full plans for NATO enlargement, including, by the way, Ukraine as early as 1992. I recently spoke with a leading historian who's working through archival materials. He explained to me Ukraine was on the list already in 1992. Because the US is arrogant. I'm sorry to tell you another secret if we can just keep it among ourselves. The US believes it's the it runs the world. It's the sole superpower and it can do what it wants. And because of American values, we can do whatever we want. Whether it's subversive operations, overthrowing governments, launching wars on false pretenses, bombing Belgrade, bombing Libya, doesn't matter. 
but don't expect to get the straight story because you won't. Starting in the mid 1990s, there was already a detailed account of what the timeline would be. If I can pull up an article, I'll try while we're talking. I just want to quote to you from uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who laid out uh, in a foreign affairs article, which is a kind of uh, you know way that uh, the insiders explain to the New York elite what's really going on. And he wrote already exactly the game plan. Uh, and uh, I think it's just funny to, uh, to read it. Um, let me see if I can find it. Okay, so here's Brzezinski writing in uh, uh, 1997, September, October issue of Foreign Affairs. He says, quote, accordingly, NATO and EU enlargement should move forward in deliberate stages. Assuming a sustained American and Western European commitment, here is a speculative but realistic timetable for these stages. By 1999, the first three Central European members will have been admitted into NATO. By that, he means Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic. Although their inclusion in the EU will probably not take place before 2002 or 2003, it was 2004. By 2003, the EU is likely to have initiated accession talks with all three Baltic republics. And NATO will likewise have moved forward on their membership as well as that of Romania and Bulgaria with their accession likely to be completed before 2005. Check the box. Between 2005 and 2010, Ukraine will, Ukraine provided it has made significant domestic reforms and has become identified as Central European country should also be ready for initial negotiations with the EU and NATO. Uh, it happened in 2008. In other words, Brzezinski's not speculating. Brzezinski's telling you the plan, uh, and he's laying out what is going to happen. Well, this plan did not sit well with the Russians. They said, no, do not move NATO to our nearly 2,000 kilometer border with Ukraine. Do not do it. The United States is deaf. So first came uh, the first three expansions. And then, as you heard, there were seven under George W. Bush, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, and Romania. Then in 2008, OK, drum roll, uh, the US insists that uh, Ukraine and Georgia will be members. And if you look at a map, all they're doing is playing out Brzezinski's plan to surround Russia in the Black Sea. Because with Ukraine and Georgia, you have Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia completely surrounding Russia in the Black Sea. That's the plan. It's not even subtle. So Putin said, in 2007, look, we want to cooperate. We're trying to cooperate, but don't keep expanding NATO because you said <laughs> not one inch eastward. And now you have it's 10 countries and now it's going to be 12 and then it's going to be 14 and you're surrounding us. OK, again, the United States didn't listen, but there was bad luck for the US, which is the Ukrainian people did not want NATO expansion. If you look at the opinion surveys and just go on Wikipedia to take a look, because they're all collated in Wikipedia, the surveys at each date, about 10 surveys, large majorities against NATO enlargement. And President Viktor Yanukovych was elected and became president in 2010, and he pushed for Ukraine's neutrality. And he pushed for Russia to have a long-term lease till 2042 in Sevastopol and the Black Sea region where the Russian fleet has been based since 1783. Ah, that's a good reason to overthrow him, which is what the US policy became by the end of 2013. So when protests broke out over Yanukovych's delay in signing an EU accession agreement and whether those protests 
were originally provoked, originally spontaneous. I'll leave it to Professor Kachanovsky to help us understand. But soon they were militarized and paramilitarized by really um, violent groups from especially from Western Ukraine. And we know from a taped intercept on February 6th, 2014, Victoria Newland discussing who the next government is going to be two weeks later. And she describes on the tape her partners back in Washington. Who are they? The Veep, that's uh, Joe Biden, and the Veep's national security advisor, that's Jake Sullivan. So the team is the same team as in power right now that played the overthrow of Yanukovych. Now, when the overthrow occurred, I got a call, oh, come to Kiev and meet the new government. And when a government asks, I went. And when I went, the Maidan was still swirling with people and a US person explained to me, oh, how the US, they were so proud how the US had helped finance this, uh, uh, this uh, these demonstrations, this was an NGO explaining how much money they had put into financing the demonstrations. It made me sick, by the way, to know this, the contrivance and the uh, role of the United States in the overthrow. Okay, we're not allowed to talk about any of that, so please keep this uh, to ourselves. It's just 467 of us, but you will not read about this at all. Then we know the war broke out, not in February 2022. The war broke out in February 2014. And again, Professor Kachanovsky is by far the authority on what happened in Odessa, what happened in Crimea, what happened in the Donbas. But already this was civil war. And Already by 2015, NATO was pouring in weapons. And there was a UN backed attempt at peace, especially the Minsk II agreement, and supposedly co guaranteed by France and Germany, and the Ukrainians brazenly this new Ukrainian US NATO backed government just said, we're not implementing that. So they signed it, they didn't implement it. Angela Merkel said uh, a few months ago in a quite notorious interview, oh no, 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 it was just to buy time for Ukraine so it could strengthen itself. Well, billions of dollars of weapons went in. Biden came into office and Putin put forward a draft security agreement in December 2021 that was to be an agreement between NATO and Russia on security arrangements, calling for, at the center, stopping the enlargement. I spoke to White House officials, a, a senior White House official at the end of 2021. I said, Avoid the war, for heaven's sake, stop the NATO enlargement. Do you get it? This has been the issue all along. And I was told, never, we will never negotiate over that issue. NATO has a, quote, open door, just like I'm sure we'd say with Mexico, if it allies with China. I can't say the real word that applies to this because it's not in polite company. But this is not grown up behavior. This is provocation of war. So in the middle of January 2022, the US formally rejected any discussion about NATO enlargement. And if you read the minutes of Russia's National Security Council meeting on the eve of the invasion, and the meeting took place, I believe it was the 21st of February. You can see all the statements. They're all about NATO. Putin opens, 
He says, we tried to stop NATO enlargement, but they weren't serious. And the United States is without any credibility whatsoever. And then Lavrov speaks next, and he describes the negotiating process and how it failed, and that uh, the uh, NATO countries were unwilling to discuss the disposition of NATO. Okay, that's the war. The war broke out within a month. Zelensky said, you know, maybe we could be neutral. And negotiations started in Ankara with Turkish mediation. And I spoke to the Turkish mediators. I spoke to people who were deeply involved in this. There was rapid progress made on the basis of Ukrainian neutrality. Then one day the Ukrainians showed up and said, no, uh, we're taking a pause from the negotiations. The best estimate given to us by former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in a very interesting long interview that he gave online a couple of months ago said, yeah, the US stopped it. He said, I didn't agree with them, but they thought that they needed to be tough towards China, that it would be a sign of weakness to go along with this. Honest to God. Honestly, it's worse than five-year-olds. And so the war continued, the negotiations ended. We've had another year. They don't care about the lives lost in Washington. They don't care. Even Romney <laughs> wrote an article saying this war is great. Russia is losing, Russia's being bled, and not one American life is being lost. He actually had the stupidity to write that, or the, the evil to write that. Okay, that's the story. If we want this war to end, we got to negotiate, and it's got to be based on no NATO enlargement. There is no other way this war will end. Why? Because if Ukraine is victorious on the battlefield, Russia will use nuclear weapons. And if Ukraine fails on the battlefield, well, the whole thing's moot. And the third option is the war goes on forever, which is American style wars. Yeah, sure, we can just fight forever. If we want peace, we actually have to tell the truth, which is that there are limits to NATO enlargement. And I'm sorry to say, Canada is absolutely an accomplice to this. And what's a shame for me is I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Canada was due south for me, so you were my southern neighbor uh, in Windsor. I always regarded Canada as the sane part of the continent because I knew that the United States was the crazy part of the continent. But I'm not seeing in Canadian leadership now any honesty about this at all. I'm sorry to tell you. And I've had some interactions that I don't like because this is all gung-ho militarism. And uh, as uh, Bianca said at the opening, uh, the foreign minister, it was the foreign minister, right, Bianca, who said, this is not the time to talk about peace. This is the time yeah. for war. We yeah. don't have diplomats anymore, ladies and gentlemen. We just have diplomats trying to prove that they're warmongers. We don't have any diplomats because life doesn't matter. It's Ukrainians there. And the Ukrainians, well, they are suffering beyond belief. Their government has gambled everything of their country on the US backing. It's a terrible gamble. I tried to tell them, ask the Vietnamese, ask the Nicaraguans, ask, ask Afghanistan, ask Libya, ask the Syrians. Is it great to gamble with the US as your backer? Not so good. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks for that totally brilliant and incredibly clear uh, presentation and just for helping us cut through the thin 
um, and to understand the historical timeline as well, so important in making sense of all of this, um, and the call for honesty, um, really hearing that loud and clear. Um, also, thank you for going against the grain so bravely um, and telling it like it is. I think the message is very clear. Um, like you said, we got to negotiate. Um, I found your messaging very so a very sober reminder of the stakes um, and the need for peace. So um, I do look very, very forward to hearing more from you uh, during the discussion period, Q&A. Thank you, Jeffrey. We're now going to be hearing from uh, Ivan Kachanovsky. Um, Ivan is a University of Ottawa professor who has published four books and numerous articles, including the far right, um, the Euromaidan and the Maidan massacre in Ukraine, um, the hidden origin of the escalating Ukraine-Russia conflict. Um, so, so happy to have you here with us. Uh, welcome, Ivan. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure to talk about this uh, issue um, at this event, um, but I think this is a very important issue and this is a very crucial issue, not only to Ukraine, but also to Canada and many other countries and to many people in other countries. So this is also a huge uh, tragedy uh, for Ukraine and Ukrainians. And as a Ukrainian scholar, and a Canadian scholar, uh, who specialized in the conflicts in Ukraine for a very long time. I based my uh, talk, brief talk at this event on my academic research, which I started since I wrote my PhD dissertation in the United States. And I also specialized in the research um, uh, policy of Western countries towards Ukraine and other uh, post-Soviet countries. So my talk is based on my academic research. And uh, I think this is very important to, I think, uh, emphasize that uh, representation of this conflict in the Western media and by Western politicians, as Professor Jeffrey Sachs already mentioned, is very far from reality. And I think um, this is, uh, I think, a crucial issue because I base my research on original data, on original sources, and um, I publish my research in peer review articles and books. So this is why I provide my uh, talk uh, based on my research and original data. And I can say that uh, this uh, war in Ukraine, again, which Russia launched uh, in February of 2022, was illegal and uh, based on false claims of a genocide, for instance, of Russians or Russian speakers in Donbass, or that Ukraine has a Nazi regime. So this is was false. Uh, claim and false justification of the war by Russia, because I study these issues, again, Ukraine is not neo-Nazi, uh, country is, has no neo-Nazi government, and there was uh, no genocide of Russians in uh, Donbass, and there was no evidence that uh, there was imminent uh, attack by Ukrainian forces in Donbass, trying to take um, back uh, this uh, region of Ukraine, which was controlled by separatist uh, forces at the time, which were supported by Russia. But uh, again, uh, I, as I wrote uh, before this was started, before the Russian invasion, this conflict, which has very devastating consequences to Ukraine, could have been prevented and avoided. And it was possible for Ukraine to, for instance, uh, bec become a, a successful country which would avoid devastation from this war by declaring its neutrality, uh, that Ukraine would not join NATO. And uh, chances of Ukraine joining NATO in any case were close to zero in the near future or foreseeable future. And this was acknowledged by Zelensky, this was acknowledged by NATO leadership and by Western countries, but publicly they did not um, want to talk about this. And I think this was a missed opportunity. And in exchange, Ukraine could have been uh, offered a membership in, in the European Union, which would promote Ukraine as um, economic development, but also would help uh, Ukraine to become a democracy and, um, and, and uh, uh, such countries, uh, similar countries, other post-communist countries like uh, Poland or uh, Czech Republic or Slovakia or Slovenia would have been examples of such uh, future development of Ukraine and peaceful resolution of conflicts. But this uh, did not happen and, uh, and Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, and, um, but after Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was also possibility of peaceful resolution of this conflict uh, when uh, was um, Zelensky initially accepted uh, negotiations with Russia and um, he again agreed uh, to a possibility of such a deal in which Ukraine could have uh, become a neutral country and um, 
uh, and uh, uh, Russia um, again um, uh, was uh, basically, uh, uh, I think, uh, according to some information published by Fiona Hill and other sources, uh, Western sources and Ukrainian sources, Russia uh, would have been ag agreed basically to retreat or to withdraw from uh, occupied regions of Ukraine, with exception of Donbass and Crimea, which were annexed by Russia. So there was such possibility, but after uh, Russian annexation of um, of uh, these regions, it became much more difficult uh, to achieve such a peaceful resolution. Uh, but at the time, uh, this peace deal in April of 2022 was basically blocked by Western countries because they decided to use Ukraine basically as a proxy to fight uh, Russia uh, or to weaken Russia. And I think this is, uh, I think, very important development, which was confirmed by a variety of uh, sources, including Israeli Prime Minister, that was first reported by Ukrainska Pravda. Uh, citing sources close to Zelensky, and so this is, I think, based on um, on uh, very solid evidence, which is again not reported by the media or, um, or omitted by the media, and uh, this is was a very crucial issue to understand this conflict and this uh, war. And uh, this war, actually, based on my research, started with um, kind of again uh, without justification. It was legal invasion and war of choice by Russia, by Putin, but it uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine, violent conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and conflict in Ukraine, which became violent, started with Maidan, with the Maidan massacre in particular. And based on my research and based on overwhelming evidence, which, are, which was revealed uh, recently by the Maidan massacre trial and investigation in Ukraine, this evidence shows that um, this massacre of Maidan protesters and the police was um, perpetrated and organized not by the Yanukovych government and his forces, but it was organized by elements of the Maidan opposition, in particular far-right opposition and oligarch oligarchic parties, which used this false flag massacre to uh, overthrow Yanukovych and to, uh, again, uh, seize power in Ukraine. And this is, I think, was very important development, which is again not reported by major media, mainstream media. Even so, there are now testimonies of absolute majority of wounded Maidan protesters at the Maidan massacre trial. There are over 500 witnesses which report the same, with similar evidence. There are forensic examinations. There are videos of such snipers, which I publish as my research. They are publicly available data published on, in peer-reviewed articles, which is recently. My article was accepted, a new peer reviewed article about Maidan Massacre Thailand on revelations was accepted kind of, uh, by academic journal. So all this evidence is available, but uh, this is again not reported by the major media. And I think this is just one example of misrepresentation of this crucial conflict and, and its origins and how it was possible to avoid this conflict and resolve this conflict uh, peacefully. And also after the Maidan Massacre, which led to overthrow of Yanukovych government, Russia retaliated by um, uh, annexing Crimea, which was again illegal under international law, and Crimea was the most pro-Russian region, which supported sep uh, separatists and joining Russia, even before, again, a Russian uh, annexation of this Crimea, in particular in the 1990s, there was a popular movement in Crimea for joining Russia, and public opinion polls showed such support, because Crimea was populated by ethnic Russians, uh, but again, uh, this annexation was illegal under international law. And afterwards, there was also start of a civil war in Donbass, in another region, which was uh, for Russian region, according to survey data, and according to other evidence. And it was also populated by uh, ethnic Russians, close to half of Donbass population was ethnically Russian. And, um, uh, and this uh, region, uh, basically, uh, there was another start of conflict. Uh, kind of separatist war in Donbass, and Russia first indirectly supported this uh, war and separatists in Donbass, and later they uh, intervened militarily in uh, August of 2014 and in winter 2015. And uh, finally, uh, this conflict, which also became conflict not only in Ukraine, but also between uh, West and Russia, because uh, Western countries supported, de facto supported, violent overthrow of the Ukrainian government in 2014, and um, and uh, basically turn, uh, and treated Ukraine as a client state of the United States. This led um, again and escalated with the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Again, which was illegal, 
which led to very terrible consequences to Ukraine. And I think uh, kind of a solution to this conflict, military solution of this conflict would be very difficult um, kind of now to achieve is a specific peaceful resolution of this conflict. But military solution to, of, to this conflict would be, I think, um, kind of would be much more negative in terms of consequences to Ukraine, because Ukraine has uh, still a big disadvantage in terms of weapons and in terms of military and manpower compared to uh, Russia, military personnel compared to Russia, and Russia can still use nuclear weapons. So chances of uh, basically of Ukraine defeating Russia militarily by and taking back Crimea and uh, Donbass are close to zero. But this means that if you can would rely and continue to rely on military force, uh, possibility of winning this conflict is uh, very minimal. And, uh, and for this reason, I think this is a policy which is, uh, would be very negative consequences to Ukraine without any chances of success. And uh, this would mean that I think peaceful resolution is the uh, kind of, is the uh, alternative which would be, again, uh, 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 real alternative which can provide uh, much more would be beneficial to UK and Ukrainians in the um, in the immediate future and in the long term future. And I think this is again not mentioned uh, by the media and by politicians who just advance uh, military kind of um, solution or military kind of uh, basically military continuation of the war in UK. Um, to advance their own goals, but this is again uh, not a realistic option, and I think this is why it's a very dangerous um, kind of development because this conflict can escalate, and Russia can still use uh, uh, a variety of military weapons to escalate this conflict. Even so, Russia is not likely to kind of be able to capture entire Ukraine, all territory of Ukraine. But again, um, in the case of any kind of uh, development in Ukraine, I think Russia would uh, still be able to keep control of a large part of Ukrainian territory, and uh, which again uh, would be, uh, for Ukraine, would be very difficult to kind of, uh, to deal with in the future, because this would mean a loss of uh, territory and a very a significant economic loss and a very significant loss of life because of many, very large number of military casualties and also civilian casualties and devastation in different regions of Ukraine, and again, a very negative economic impact, uh, which has um, kind of um, such a situation. In addition to this, there is also very large um, uh, flow of refugees from Ukraine, including to countries like uh, Poland, uh, Germany, and many of them also came to Canada, and Canada offered such program. But in addition to this, there were also a lot of um, refugees to Russia. And finally, if I can mention in terms of policy of Western countries, towards this conflict, I think this policy can be evaluated based on academic research and based on academic sources, which I already mentioned, but also I think it's very important to apply the same standards to Ukraine, uh, to policy of Ukraine as um, if it would be policies which will be very difficult to accept in their own countries. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, we, I thought you, I thought we lost you, but I think we got I think we got it all. I think we're good. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Ivan, thank you, thank you, thank you for that presentation um, and for doing such painstaking uh, academic work, um, highlighting the critical history and regional dynamics um, in the lead up to this war that we don't read about in the New York Times or the Globe and Mail. Um, and thanks also for your um, compassionate suggestions about how to end this conflict, the alternatives that could benefit the people of Ukraine and warnings against uh, increased military force. Please do consider getting a copy of uh, one of Yvonne's books. Um, they're great resources. We put the links uh, in the chat for those. Um, Yvonne is a Ukraine expert at the University of Ottawa and is doing very, very important work uh, and research. It's so great to see all of the uh, interest in this discussion. Um, there's over 450 of us here at this live virtual event. Um, I think that's a good sign. Um, please do consider sharing this event on, uh, on your Facebook pages. It's, uh, we're also doing this on a Facebook Live. It'd be great to have even more people uh, watch and, and, and get educated on these, uh, on these issues. Um, so thanks so much um, to our panelists, um, Jeffrey and Yvonne. Um, we are uh, now going to head into the Q&A. We have a little bit 
um, of time. And um, we do have a few journalists who have shown up and would like to ask a question. We can see if we can figure out how this works. Um, Rachel, if you could help me um, just promote um, Michael to uh, a panelist, Michael Klassen from Bridge City News, um, or unmute him. Rachel, are you able to do that? Yes, Michael, you should now be unmuted. Please speak. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, it's been delightful to hear this conversation. Um, I have two kind of forward thinking questions. The first one is, what do you see as the ramifications of the generational loss of life in Ukraine? Is this, this, is this question directed towards Yvonne or Jeffrey or both? Uh, Professor Sachs. If I got that right. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, well, uh, just to briefly, of course, this is uh, devastating for Ukraine uh, because uh, millions of people are refugees. Young people have left. Uh, the economy is destroyed. The cities and infrastructure are being destroyed. It's, it's a catastrophe. And when this war started, I said to the U.S. and I wrote in public that um, NATO and led by the U.S. will make Ukraine the next Afghanistan. Uh, and by that, I meant a country left in ruins by prolonged war. And that's the path that we're on right now. Uh, of course, to save Ukraine, we need to stop the war through negotiations, not by some military victory, this illusory victory over a country with 1,600 deployed nuclear weapons. It doesn't even make sense what our governments say. They have no plan. They have no strategy. They're politicians. They're playing until the next news cycle. They have no strategy. Thank you. Thank you. And is, is that it? Did you have a follow up? Well, yes, one other one. And I think it's related. Uh, uh, coming from a Christian perspective, the Bible says that every seed produces after its own kind. Do you see this and what's been happening in financial markets as the sun setting on the American empire? Well, I think if we're just speaking technically about it, we are at the end of the American led world. By, by fact, uh, not, not even by these disastrous blunders, but simply by the fact that other countries, and of course, most notably China, but not China alone, has very talented, well-educated, skilled uh, people with a, a strong infrastructure and strong technology. So a country, the US, with 4.1% of the world population should never presume to run the world or to write the rules. We are intrinsically in a multipolar world. <clears throat> but the whole idea of neoconservatism in the United States, and that's the government we have right now, and it's bipartisan, it's Democrats and Republicans, is that <clears throat> the US is the unique unipolar country and it must resist any potential competitors, most importantly, China and Russia is viewed as a you know, more minor regional threat. It's mind boggling, but that is the literal view of Victoria Newland. It is the view of her husband, Robert Kagan, who writes these books that are shocking in their naivete. Uh, like the jungle grows back, the whole theme of which is the world's a jungle, the US is a garden, and it's the job of the United States to stop the jungle. It's gross. That's actually, <laughs> I'm telling you, that is the guiding principles. And Canada, please think clearly. Come on, you guys are better than that, really. So please, Act better than that. Don't just follow the U.S. line into this, these uh, wars of def trying to defend hegemonic power. The next one will be in 
over Taiwan, that could end all of it. Even this one can end all of it. Today, we took what seems to be another horrible step of escalation. If it's true, who knows whether it's true or not true, but I was just watching the video that uh, the Russian government has posted of Ukrainian drones uh, uh, intercepted over the Kremlin. If this is right, are we kidding? And I wrote to leading journalists because they said, <laughs> the Financial Times wrote this afternoon, I can't even make sense of it. It said, uh, hold on, let me see if I can find it because it's so, <laughs> so indicative of of the of the crazy mindset uh oh my god yeah it, it well they changed it from when i read it this morning now it says if confirmed the apparent attempt on putin's life and the acknowledgement from the kremlin would mark an extraordinary admission of russian vulnerability Instead of saying, oh my God, are we really going to have World War III? It was taken all day by the Financial Times all afternoon as, well, look at this. What is, you know, this is Russian vulnerability. There are no grown-ups right now in our governments or in the media that parrot our governments. It's, I've never, honestly, I'm 68. I've been through the Vietnam War, through the Gulf Wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, uh, Serbia, Syria, countless CIA overthrows of governments. I've never seen anything like we're seeing right now. And it may be because of this desperation of the US of uh, somehow seeing its hegemonic rule questioned or it may be that they've lost their minds out of decades of arrogance i don't know what it is thank you thank you for that uh, commentary um we're going to move on to the next uh journalist um alex koch from the maple um alex are you there hello hello yeah we can hear you hi um, this is a question for Professor Sachs. Um, to your point, uh, or to your, your plea for Canada to, to, to see reason and to uh, push for negotiations and diplomacy, my question is like, do you think that even if Canada wanted to do that, it, that it would make an impression on the United States and NATO more generally? Does Canada have the clout to actually make a difference on this issue? Canada together with other countries certainly could help the United States to see reality. So uh, if Canada and France, who I know looks askance at this, but dares not say so many times, though once in a while Macron lets something out, uh, uh, Germany, India, Brazil, China, <laughs> everybody knows that this is a disaster, but nobody tells the US. And a actually a European prime minister said to me a year ago, I said, why don't you say something? And he said, because they treat us like children. A, a prime minister of a major European country said that to me it still makes my skin crawl. I don't know why they allow themselves to be treated like children. The United States is not all powerful. It can't even, it, it can't put one foot ahead of the next one these days. So there's actually no reason but to say, you know, this isn't working so well. We, we actually need to think through this before the world gets blown up. And there is no strategy on this because 
Ukraine could lose on the battlefield, and if it wins, it gets destroyed. This is, and, and all we're told, the only thing we're told, Biden had one minute of honesty a year ago. He said, we're on a path to Armageddon. All the newspapers immediately rose up in unison and said, don't talk like that. Don't ever say that again. We're not, we're not allowed to say that. It's, it's unbelievable. So yes, Canada can make a difference, but not by itself. But the fact of the matter is a lot of leaders know this, but one by one, they're scared. Thank you, Jeffrey. Alex, um, did you have a follow up or? Yeah, kind of related to that. Um, I mean, obviously this, this conflict has resulted in new members of NATO being added so in the short term, it looks like, you know, NATO is uh, stronger in a, in a sense as a result of this war. But in the long term, do you think this war will uh, actually weaken NATO standing in the international community or will it continue to, to, to grow in your opinion? Well, the, the most important thing is to define the international community. <laughs> the international community is the US, Canada, Britain, the European Union, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. Those are the countries that are aligned with the US. The rest of the world is nowhere near this. The attitude of the rest of the world is, holy shit, what are you guys doing? And you're killing us in the interim because we actually have a lot of hungry people. Uh, we have a lot of problems. You've disrupted the whole world economy. And so remember that it's 20% of the world is the international community, according to the United States. We, and then they can't understand, oh, how could Lula say this? How could Lula go to China? How could the Saudis say this? They don't understand anything about the world that I live in, which is the other 80% of the world watching this. The other 80% of the world ain't impressed, believe me. And they're not standing up and rooting for the United States. And what we consider the world, or sometimes called the West, which is a term I hate for basically because it's such a bad term to describe this, but it is essentially the North Atlantic countries that have been the dominant countries for the last two centuries, plus the honorary members, uh, Japan uh, and, uh, and Korea, um, and the Anglo-Saxon offshoots, so-called, of Australia and New Zealand. That's it. And uh, they don't understand that the rest of the world actually has other concerns and doesn't want to back a NATO expansion war and doesn't want to live under the threat of nuclear annihilation because of the unwillingness of Ottawa and Washington to negotiate over NATO enlargement. Thank you. So we're at the top of the hour now. I'm going to try and squeeze in. We have one last journalist, um, Aiden from the Canada Files. Are you there? Um, we'll, we'll have to be a little bit brief as uh, we've come pretty much to the end of our time. But uh, Aiden, please do ask your question. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Uh, thank you, uh, Aiden Jonah, Editor-in-Chief of Canada Files. So I have a question for Mr. Sox. So uh, the campus recently, we interviewed uh, Dmitry Laskaris, who is on a uh, fact-finding trip to Russia, and also Canadian Tamara Lorenz uh, also went on a fact-finding trip to Russia a few months before that. What are your thoughts on the value of fact-finding trips to Russia and understanding their perspective with this conflict? As a general matter, I'm in favor of all possible discussion and outreach of various kinds, uh, whether it's uh, academics or cultural uh, or sports. Uh, I don't want to see Russia boycotted in the Olympics. 
I find all of this idea of dividing the world to be extraordinarily dangerous. And the idea that we don't talk to our counterparts to be extraordinarily dangerous. For me, you know, fact finding is fine and good. In fact, not just fine, but <laughs> picking Biden picking up the phone and speaking with President Putin wouldn't be bad. You know, even if they didn't agree, talk, have a Zoom together, hear each other's points of view. But that would require the maturity of maybe a 17 year old. I don't know. But these are kids. These are children, the way they behave. And it's all bullying, shouting, taunting, humiliating, not talking. So this is incredible. When did Prime Minister Trudeau last speak to, to uh, President Putin? And why not? Canada's got big stakes in this. Is it just we repeat whatever propaganda we want, or do we talk to each other? Hear the ideas. That is my biggest recommendation of all, talk. Hmm. I think that is an excellent note on which to end our event today. I, I wish we had more time. Wow, that was so amazing. Um, but that's all that our schedule allows for today. Um, it's been illuminating, it's been important. It's also a relief um, to have such a sane and uh, you know, although sobering dialogue because everything is at stake as we've heard from our speakers and we're not getting the information that we need. Um, so please do share this event um, with your friends. Um, let's do our part uh, to move in the direction of peace um, and to challenge Trudeau's policies, which is where we have a little bit of power um, I want to thank our audience at home. Um, I want to thank World Beyond War Canada, Justice Advocates and Rights Actions, today's co-sponsors. Thanks to Rachel Small for your help uh, behind the scenes. Um, thanks to Jeffrey and Yvonne for sharing your vast, vast knowledge with all of us um, and, uh, and for your bravery. Um, I think we've all learned a great deal. And uh, in these bleak times, it was, uh, it was really wonderful to spend time talking about peace. So as Jeffrey said, uh, and I quote, Unfortunately, there are no grown-ups here. Um, and open quote, Canada, think clearly, please. Yes. Um, all right. So good, good, goodbye, everyone. That's it for our program. Please do consider donating to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute at foreignpolicy.ca slash donation. Um, every, every penny uh, goes a long way. We're on a shoestring budget. Um, bye bye, everyone. Bye, Yvonne. Bye, Jeffrey. Thank you. Uh, that's it for our program. Peace. Bye.